Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. You guys are good to go. Uh, my name is Jeff Ware. I'm president of Certs Brewing Company over in Buffalo, New York. I'll be moderating uh, today, meaning I'll pretty much uh, introduce Fred here and then sit here and, and watch him do his thing. Uh, so um, next to me, we have Fred Nixon of Deutsche. Um, uh, Fred is a native New Yorker. Fred has spent more than 20 years in hospitality, project management, and craft beverage sales. Fred has been with Deutsche Beverage Technology for four years and is the Northeast Sales Manager with a focus on capital asset sales in the craft beverage, excuse me, craft beer, craft distilling, and coffee extraction industries. Uh, at that, I will just pass it over to Fred. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, Nice sunny days here in, uh, in Albany. Uh, definitely very nice here and appreciate the introduction and everybody rolling out the red carpet in, um, here in Albany. Um, a coworker originally titled this as uh, How to Build a Brewery and I didn't like it, so on the slides it's changed. Is the slideshow up? Is the slideshow up? No. no. Uh, expanding or about to embark on building a brewery. All right, excellent. Yeah, so um, again, I, I changed up the, the title a little bit here just because I thought saying how to build a brewery is a little bit much when a lot of you have built a brewery or are going through expansions or going through any layer of different portions of your business model. So really more than anything, you know, building a brewery and what we see as you know, manufacturers in, in the industry, um, we, we Deutsche Beverage Technologies been around for about 12 years. We um, manufacture custom brew houses. Um, we do uh, you know, cellar tanks, kind of in the range from two all the way up to 400 barrel uh, systems. We uh, are a huge Siemens platform, so we make all of our own uh, automation platforms in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but uh, we also work in a number of other industries. We have a sister company, Deutsche Process. It's hemp and uh, cannabis oil extraction, but cold brew um, distilling, which has taken off and is, has paid a compliment to the beer world, especially over the last year. Um, I think it happened when everybody was buying a small pot still to make sanitizer during during COVID. So um, yeah, the biggest thing, our, our, our backbone of the of our business is craft beer. So thank you all. Um, we do have a, a nice customer base in, in New York. Um, our business started with, you know, selling kegs and then getting a, kind of getting our foot in the door with that years ago and then uh, into custom fermenters and then into brew houses all the while working with Siemens. Uh, but we don't third party it out, so it's, a, it's all done in-house, so it's a, it's a nice hallmark for our business. Um, again, more than anything, I hope to hit on some brewery considerations, trends in the industry that we're seeing a lot of right now, and then some practices. Some things won't, I, I imagine, will be a lot that you all see, but really how we've seen the industry pivot a little bit over the last couple of years coming out of COVID, hopefully, and then really how beer is, is looked at. New York's a pretty unique uh, state just because of laws and your ability with a farm license to be, have a little bit more flexibility. Um, so with that, Um, again, getting into some considerations, trends, and practices. Um, I'll go through some, you know, basic brewery styles that you all certainly see. Talking about production breweries or farm breweries or you know basic tap rooms and things, and and how we've seen them develop over the years, and and really where where we're seeing those different scaled uh, systems right now. This particular um, system is a 20 barrel in, um, in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, 
in this uh, second second road or second street brewing and they they've got a farm brewery they have a production brewery and then they have another pub so kind of what we would call like a hub and spoke system where the main production place um, ends up feeding other locations where they don't necessarily have to make a capital investment in every single place with the system <coughs> um, look to cover you know again some brewery types more than anything, some things that we are seeing a lot of right now, um, some planning and build out assumptions and some things that people tend to miss. Um, really, it's the one that always comes up is, you know, really piping costs, glycol, steam, associated grain handling, things like that. That's always kind of a surprise. So thinking a little bit about the planning and build out portion, other considerations and trends, whether that be marketing or kind of what kind of equipment or focus folks have these days. And then some resources, um, whether our resources to you all, um, sister companies of ours like Wild Goose, who's here in our booth, uh, Wild Goose Filling, and then Link to Hospitality, that's a partner of ours through our parent company, Middleby, that they sell kitchen appliances, um, you know, anything from Turbo Chef that you see in their booth upstairs to Viking Ranges. South Bend Ovens, you, you name it. So um, pretty dynamic group of resources and they do design work. So if you're building out your brewery, um, they can help you literally lay out your kitchen. Lay, and we, we would help you lay out your brewery so we can really kind of present a full turnkey package. Um, again, brewery types and then how all of these models impact your business plan. Site selection, is it going to be a ground up build? Is it going to be a renovation or really a large demolition project? Um, and then how that impacts infrastructure and really infrastructure, anything from trench drains to your steam piping, venting, things like that. And then of course your build out costs. Your typical brew pub, you know, we're, you're, we've, we've seen a lot of folks do, you know, a combination of false small food service to almost no food service or food trucks. You all very you know, know a lot of these or tap room with almost exclusively served on premise or a brew pub might have uh, a little bit of distribution. I think 25% is the Brewers Association percentage of on premise with a brew pub. Uh, production, really us internally, we would say over, you know, in that 1500 barrels, 2000 barrels and above, we would kind of say production brewery. We, ha we do have people doing like 2000 barrels on a 10 barrel system, which is a lot. Um, so thinking about those kind of considerations, when I, we talk to those folks, would they still make an investment in a 10 barrel when knowing a 15 might be close and it would make their labor and their day to day a little bit, um, less painful. Um, hub and spoke breweries is definitely something um, I'll talk a little bit more about because of seeing this, um, where you, you have a production facility, kind of like I talked about with a um, Third Street in, in Virginia, um, Lucky Hare in Watkins Glen, a lot of you guys know them, where you know, production location, tap room location, and then another tap room location. So able to feed multiple sites without having to make, again, multiple capital investments in, in large brewing equipment, or you're taking um, unfinished wort to these locations in transport tanks and conditioning it, uh, or fermenting it, conditioning it, and then serving it on site. And then um, certainly something that uh, we have seen a large spike in where there's a lot of infrastructure considerations, especially as it pertains to water, water treatment, uh, farm breweries and rural destinations, not so much beach on uh, the rural destinations, but definitely in more mountain properties, more, um, you know, getting away from the city. Bozeman, Montana is seeing this incredible influx of people from California and, um, and a lot of people interested in, in having kind of more of a rural setting in, in, a, in a place like that. And then uh, lastly, in these categories that we're still seeing um, big growth with, uh, a brew distillery. So really, whether it's a distilling operation that has um, an additional brewery, um, maybe, maybe a more, larger volume distillery with a pub system that complements the offering there, it may, they may already have the infrastructure with a mash lauder ton, 
um, to do distilling, so it could be either way, a brewery that adds distilling component, let's say they have a steam boiler, the chilling capacity already, other infrastructure items, we have seen an, an uptick in this category specifically, so um, definitely is something that is, it's nice, especially if you do have a, a farm brewery designation, this is um, a pretty easy add for the most part if you're looking for a small still for the most part. Um, one, one farm brewery we work with, uh, Warwick Farm Brewing in uh, Jameson, PA, in Bucks County, about 40 minutes outside of Philly. Um, these guys were you know, in, like, kind of perfect example, and they would definitely say it of folks that just had no idea all the different things they would run into with zoning, water treatment. They ended up having to put in a septic field that was the size of a football field for knowing putting out almost 4,000 gallons of water in a week. You know, where is this water going? Um, a separate retention pond because the city had no clue what they were really doing. Bringing in power, bringing in three-phase power for at least 250 to 300 amp service for brewing equipment and then thinking about the potential for adding a tap room, which they just did. So really, they, they've been open for coming up on three years, but they were really can pick up for the longest time, then did this outdoor space. But they're on 30 acres, so they've, they, it almost worked better for them to not have the tap room, not have this huge labor model as they now have just opened their tap room because this beer garden is, you know, kind of serves itself. People come in, uh, really no keg pouring. It was all pick up your cans, you can consume them there. And they had food trucks. So I think they're a really good example of, you know, these destination farm brewing. They grow their own hops there, so they do um, they do a little bit with whole cone, like uh, wet hop lagers and things like that. But uh, definitely, if you're ever outside of uh, Philadelphia, they, they're fantastic guys, um, and they've kind of, you know, outkicked like, their expectations. Well, within the next year, they'll be going from a seven barrel that they're doing about 2,000 barrels a year on, which they can't keep up, to a 30 barrel production facility. <clears throat> Uh, Lucky Hare, you, you all probably know the guys over in Watkins Glen. Definitely want to um, talk about them because they, 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 they do a very good job. Great beer, great people if you, uh, if you don't know any of them. Ian's also on the board here and um, really look up to these guys. They're a great customer of ours, but you know, they have a, a new production facility and, um, and they also have their original, tu uh, the original pub in uh, Hector and then, and then another uh, pub over in Ithaca. So again, when I talked about where this kind of a hub and spoke principle of having a production facility feed multiple locations and do do a very good job uh, with that. And this is a view from uh, from the Hector location, looking down at the lake. <clears throat> So just like I said earlier, uh, considerations with each of these, I think labor is huge right now, and staffing, even as a manufacturer, we get calls all the time of, from current or potential customers or existing customers that, that are looking for a brewer, looking for good seller folks, you know, possible manager of their tap room, there still is a staffing sh uh, shortage, but um, it's, it's you know, really critical and how you, you know, pick your tap room, you're definitely gonna have, you know, your front of house staff, your back of the house staff. So there's, there's a lot of weighing those options there. Are you going to have food service and what layer of food service you're gonna have? I think we've seen a little bit of a shift away from it just because people don't want to deal with the historical drama of, um, you know, restaurant, like owning a restaurant, running a restaurant, staffing, um, so, yeah, <laughs> coming from restaurants for, for a long time, it's, I, I totally understand, but uh, there's still some pros because, you know, the revenue's there, but food trucks have certainly subsidized a lot of that, and the people have done it very well. Um, On-premise food service, so having your own kitchen, your own chef. Um, some neat things you all, I do recommend you guys go up um, and see the guys at Link2 Hospitality. They have an office in Pittsburgh, they have an office in Rochester, and then they have a Link2 beverage division that is, that will, you know, help you complement your design and kind of guide you through really realistic expectations so you can see what a turbo chef can do for, 
a small operation where you're just pushing, putting out pizzas and pork sliders like they're doing upstairs at a pretty minimal labor. Um, so you can have that element to some le level of on-premise business without really breaking the bank. What was the name of that place? Link to hospitality, yeah. Uh, Jeff and uh, Julio are up there, and they actually have their design team in today too. So they can take you through a slideshow of uh, of literally them doing like we would do. We'll do layouts even before contract uh, for folks, so they can get scale and build out process flow and understand their spaces. But uh, they will also give you elevations. So if you're building out cabinetry around your walk-in, I mean, around your uh, under-counter cooler or your taps, um, they do some, some great stuff. Um, will you be hosting events? Um, and, you know, is that you renting that out, like just having an open space, or is it something that you will be running, having an event manager, and, and dealing with that internally, personally, again, from coming from that side of the business, uh, that's a lot. It involves a lot of marketing, it involves a lot of resources, you buying the tables, you buying the glassware, you owning all that. But if you have a, an event space that's kind of a blank canvas, indoor or outdoor, I think you, you know, a lot of people see great benefits to that, whether it's weddings or rehearsal dinners or uh, festivals, uh, you name it, especially in some of these more rural settings that have become destinations. Uh, certainly seasonality with your with your locations. Is it a place that you can have uh, seating outside for Memorial Day to Labor Day? Um, especially in, in uh, this part of the state or you know, as you get down to some other um, areas closer to, to the beach or up in the Adirondacks, like really what is it, you know, I'll always say kind of that Memorial Day to Labor Day profile, thinking about seasonality. Um, proximity to population, and really I say that is, you know, everyone's talking about transportation, is it, you know, are you using an Uber or a Lyft or some sort of other transportation? And we've had some folks that, you know, just not, struggle's not the right word, but, um, you know, try to wrap their heads around this because making sure there's enough Uber drivers or transportation to get people to and from the locations is uh, is big. I know on transportation too that we've learned over the years is um, make sure you are, or, you know, if you're opening a new place, have consideration for how your staff are going to get there. A lot of your kitchen staff, especially uh, your front of house staff, are going to you know take bus routes and things of that nature. So uh, it's things that we've overlooked in the past and uh, it, you know it is a, a consideration you need to have. Thank you. Yeah, with with that, thinking about your staff as well, uh, you know, parking allocation, especially if you're in a more urban area where you have to, you may have a certain parking lot, you know, designated parking spots for the number of seats in your building, and you've got to take into consideration your staff. Um, but also, obviously, the legal the legal side of it, where you know, if it is, you know, any any locations, you know, how are these folks getting home after they've had. Um, anywhere between one and 20 beers if you were around last night. <laughs> um, again, a lot of these your uh, major considerations, not only for the operation as a whole when you're thinking about your concept, but also for your sizing your brew house, like how many barrels are you thinking about um, putting out? Is it going to be too much? Is it going to be too little? I think over the last couple of years, either by pricing and or just size, You'll have people looking at a three and a half, but a five barrel system, if you have the space, is literally only gonna be between six and eight thousand dollar more investment. If someone's looking at a five, there could be very easily considering a seven and then from a seven to a ten. So I think that you know spatial constraints, labor, um, but also barrelage output is are the are the big considerations. But then again, for sizing your brew house, for the physical space where you don't want to necessarily allocate, you know, three, four, five thousand square feet for production, versus having more room for seating for the people that are, you know, paying your rent. Um, getting into some things that are definitely big line items that sometimes. I don't want to say people overlook, but I think there's always like sticker shock when you think of floor drains, like and things that are an absolute must. Will 
get into delivering equipment and you know our engineers are on the floor uh, and the project managers and they're like well, where are the floor drains and you just like what do you mean and, and so it just creates you know an absolute disaster for your for your staff um, we will always put them in our own drawings just to kind of nudge architects like please don't forget this kind of thing um, and the pitch or the slope of the of the floor to the drains but it's certainly something not to overlook Um, one thing that we've seen a lot of is uh, it's not just um, with regards to circulating air, like by buying a big ass fan. Uh, it's a, a good company that you see a lot of those products in the marketplace. Um, but we've seen just because of you know, labor laws and certain things around there where the production space has to be heated and cooled regard, you know, in certain, certain parts of the country where I've seen that a lot in North Carolina. So production space HVAC, when you have 20, 30 foot ceilings in some of these places, it's, it's, it's a big um, consideration. You have a lot of steam coming off of your equipment. You're cleaning a lot with hot water. So certainly thinking about that when you're thinking about you know, where you know, maybe your production area is in, a, in a, the higher roof part of the building and your cellar is not, so you don't have to condition the entire space. Fire ratings and fire codes, um, especially around milling equipment. I think a lot of fire marshals are confused about the word mill, thinking that it's um, you're at a flour mill where you know there's a lot more particulate in the air and combustibility. Um, the two manufacturers that we use the most, Rad out of Canada and then RMS out of. Uh, South Dakota, they almost always now provide us like a letter that shows particulate counts from, from milling that we can provide customers when they are going through permitting because it, we almost tell all of our architects that we're working with on projects not to put the word mill, they'll use grain cracker or grain crusher um, just because it sometimes throws up a red flag. When we were building our showroom in, in Charlotte, they made us put a six hour fire rated wall around this, essentially building a bomb shelter. They did the same for our boiler because just because they didn't know what they didn't know. So it's uh, that's certainly something to consider around your boiler boiler room and mill space. If you do get into the distilling side, I can talk a little bit more about that, but you do have to comply with what's called C1, D1, or class one, division one compliance, where usually you know you have to have at least a 10 to 12 foot perimeter around the ethanol or still creating, uh, spirit creating vessels away from other pumps and motors that wouldn't be what we what you call C1, D1, explosion proof motors, things like that. So. Certainly the safeties, those things come up for anyone, you know, doing a, a new location or adding on to an existing location where you might come out of a grandfather clause where you could have your mill in open air. Certainly take those things into consideration when you're, when you're going through design um, because there's still a lot of kind of confusion around um, that with regards to milling and boiler rooms. Really in brewing, we don't see, until you get to like really big systems, high pressure boilers where you're then stepping down to a low pressure to your jackets on your vessels. Typically a, a low pressure boiler does not require a tech on site where a high pressure boiler, I think it's now a national standard, federal mandate where you have to have someone on staff that can maintain and operate a high pressure boiler. So that's also a misconception. Um, as you look at your utilities, electric, obviously something really big. We are getting more and more questions around solar. Um, I think probably five years away from it being a little bit more economically feasible to have you know, solar to be able to handle the load of a, of a brewery, not just like your refrigeration or your lights, certain things like that with, a, with some sort of backup power. But, there's not a lot out there right now that's economically feasible for you know to be able to take the cycling demand of a chiller uh, without having a pretty considerable bank of power but definitely if you are looking at solar it's great for common areas uh, refrigeration as long as you have some sort of backup generator um, but electric as a whole um, three phase is is almost always required when you're looking at production equipment um, you know, single phase, we'll do up to, you know, the biggest um, 
I think is seven barrel. Now, again, a lot of it comes down to how the motors are rated. And then also chillers, like chillers cannot really operate above five horse uh, chiller seat so uh, above single phase or below single phase. So that is certainly a, a consideration when you're looking at your properties, looking at potential new location, you know, incoming water, electric, what those services are. If you're not going to buy the building, is the landlord going to help you with some of those things because they can be high ticket items. Um, gas, certainly everyone's talking about it right now. Natural gas, um, propane, you know, it's not cheap, um, but overall natural gas is certainly the most efficient way to heat your brew house. Um, for your other functions, especially boiler, um, or indirect fire systems or direct fire systems, however you like to say that. But electric, certainly any calculation, if we're, we have people kind of wavering between in that five to 10 barrel range and they're like, I really can't, don't have gas, can't pay for that infrastructure. We'll do, um, we can get like the, uh, kilowatt cost for your region, as well as the therm cost of a gallon of propane or a gallon of uh, natural gas. And almost always, um, Pittsburgh, for whatever reason, recently electric came in um, for a 10 barrel system. Electric was actually more in favor than gas, but historically natural gas is, is going to be cheaper per barrel by almost $3. Um, we've seen that kind of average over the last you know, five plus years. Um, water water lines. When you're sizing your water line, really a lot of based on you know what capacity uh, brew house you have. Uh, you maintaining that 15 to 20 or 15 to 30 gallon per minute flow rate. So inch and a half water line coming in at minimum uh, for most systems. If you're getting into bigger production systems above 20, you certainly look at look at that water line. You know because it's not just servicing your production system. It's servicing it could be the rest of your facility, restaurant operations restrooms, literally just water, um, the other water needs you have, um, but also your HL, HLT, CLT, do you have both of those? Um, so a lot of the times we will have people that you know make the investment in the CLT just because you have that on-demand water, it helps speed up knockout, um, but you can also recover that water back to the HLT. So oversizing the HLT, and, you know, so if you have a 30 barrel, uh, CLT and 45 barrel HLT, so you always have extra headspace to recover that water back while having that utility water, what we would call um, on demand in an HLT. Uh, we do see from time to time folks have like big Renai on demand hot water heaters run in series, so 250,000 BTUs per is, is, is a good rule of thumb. So if you want more water capacity and you're not trying to put that on you know, other utility water from your HLT, that's, it's a really good product. Again, you can run them in series, so you can have five up to a million BTUs and you know, whether you're using it for canning line, just spray down water, uh, multiple like quick connect points throughout your um, place for spray down, um, definitely, um, a consideration or if you don't have an HLT for if you don't have the room for one that is that is a, a, a good consideration also um, water filtration so I think most will do and they and you know good water filtration companies like understand where where you are and what water profiles you have uh, based on other normal business. So um, there's a company called Water RX, like water prescription, that does a pretty good job and they sub it out so they can come out, do a water profile test for you and really kind of tell you what you need to add or not add to your water profile in brewing. <clears throat> Again, water and water treatment. This is one that has come up a lot. Uh, we've seen it. I don't know how many of you deal with this, especially in urban areas, but in Atlanta, Georgia now, it's it's becoming mandate. There's, there's a company that is, and the city's requiring that you have this monitoring system that is checking the water levels of your all of your outbound water. So you have some cities that like some of the bio that's going back out, the probiotics, the yeast that's like almost helping uh, some of these municipalities and their water treatment centers. Um, but incoming water in Charlotte, you are charged for, for every gallon in, you're charged for uh, two gallons out. So just for, that's all breweries. So it's, 
certainly something of consideration. It sounds like Charlotte, North Carolina is about to have the same monitoring system installed. You might be able to be grandfathered in, but it's, it's not going to be pleasant for a lot of people because you have to, you know, it's like a $20,000 investment for this monitoring system and this chemical that will dose your outbound water. So it's literally monitored remotely. So it's connected to your Wi-Fi or to like cell phone signal and they're watching your water all the time. So I think it's called Biomed. I wouldn't be surprised if you see them at CBC. They're you know, selling it to folks that are interested in it, but a lot of cities, municipalities are actually forcing it upon um, local breweries which is tough. Um, glycol piping, steam piping, and appropriate venting. I would say this, these are always some of the biggest surprises that customers will have or breweries will have as far as cost. Um, historically, we'll say, if you, let's say you invest $250,000 in your capital assets, including your boiler, chiller, all of that stuff, your brew house, your tanks, you could almost anticipate 50 to 60% of that you could be spending in piping if it's done professionally. Um, sometimes people, you know, they, they know great local trades and, you know, plumbers, et cetera, that they can do it um, correctly. I, whoever is your manufacturer, I would just lean on them to, you know, make those recommendations for insulating your, insulating your pipes so you're not, you don't have any heat loss um, or condensation dripping on your tanks. Um, there is something called wet steam, where if, you're, if your um, steam lines aren't insulated, or if there is a drop and then they and then they go horizontal and then come back up again, you can get steam that turns into water in the corners, and eventually that can get into your steam jackets and it can eat away at the welds inside of there. And it's not usually it's not a manufacturer defect of the of the asset. It's it comes from something called wet steam, which is a, a byproduct of of sometimes the heat loss that you get in non-insulated pipes. So again, glycol steam, appropriate venting, the venting really off your kettle. You're gonna do a condenser if you have a short ceiling or you know, we see it a lot in New Jersey where almost everyone is required to have a condenser coming off of their kettle, uh, kettle whirlpool versus being able to vent it out the top because you know, I think they, there's some misconception about the smells and the odors and things like that that come from a brewery. Um, but two things or three things really appropriate venting also as it pertains to coming off of your boiler or indirect fire burners it's a class a chimney so um, it's about eight inches in diameter or six six inches in diameter on the inside and then add another two inches of insulation on the outside with with like heavy aluminum cladding so those those are something that we don't typically do inside of our scope, but it's, you know, would be an HVAC installer, boiler installer, what we would call a burner technician that would locally come out and do that. But it is, you know, it could run anywhere between 150 to $350 a foot before it can be installed. So when you're thinking about your ceiling heights and clearances and you have 30 foot ceilings and you want an indirect fire system, certainly think about the cost associated with a class A chimney traveling you know, 25 feet above your, uh, above your burners. Grain handling, um, certainly uh, I would say as people are looking at managing costs, um, we're seeing like people doing a little bit more expansions in this, you know, going into, you know, investing in a better mill that has a you know, better crack to increase efficiencies but also looking at um, you know, more super sack unloaders to silos. Some um, grain providers will actually lease you your silo and, and then you're paying it out in your um, term of your grain. So that's certainly a great option. We do provide silos um, either through Bulk Tech, RAD, or uh, Meridian. But you know, even, even we will tell folks, you know, go to your grain provider, they may be able to provide it to you for free as part of you buying grain for them in your contract. So, but if you're buying a flex auger and, and typically up to 50 to 75 feet, your manufacturer will typically include the installation in that. That's what we do. But you get into a chain disc or cable bay or pneumatic system and they're, you know, it's, it's not cheap, you know, um, so linear foot runs, but for every, every vertical run um, is another, is, is the turn and another motor. So that's where the cost comes in. It's not from the horizontal run itself. 
So certainly, when you're thinking about the infrastructure and the costs associated, I would say those bottom three things, three or four things are extremely important as you're building out your budgets. Um, as you're thinking about infrastructure, just kind of talking about like what levels of service do, do the groups that you're working with provide. Um, in this particular case, it's a brewery in Pittsburgh that we're working on where you know, we will come in and, and help them early on in the, like I said, with boiler placement here. This is all built to code to what uh, Columbia Boiler or Allied Boiler says is their code with a three foot clearance around everything. Um, by code, you will see that almost uh, nationwide uh, for uh, rooms that were in areas where rooms are required. Again, probably a safe bet you're gonna have a three to four hour rated firewall with makeup air and venting. So there would be an exterior wall cutout or a ceiling cutout for air to return back into the room, but also venting out. And then another class A chimney coming off the burner on that, um, on that boiler itself. Um, there are a couple good companies that make um, electric steam boilers, Sussman is one of them. So if you don't want to pay these huge infrastructure costs of you know running longer steam lines for your brew house from a boiler room that could be 20 plus feet away, Sussman boiler, it's a footprint that's you know half the size of this table um, and they can be right next to your brew house, you know, Above a 10 barrel is pretty tough. You'd have to have multiple in series, and it, it, it's, a, it's a large draw on electric when, these, when your equipment's cycling. But um, it's definitely nice if you have 10 barrel and under, and you're in, maybe in an urban spot, and you don't have a ton of space to put a big boiler room, and as well as the investment of um, the piping. Um, grain handling, in this case, they didn't have the um, room above the brew house for a grist case. So this is a floor mounted grist case where the mill is actually mounted on top. And then, you know, we spec it out. So there's always room for storage. You know, that's another thing. Always plan for more storage, chemical, grain, you know, sinks where you and other drip dry areas for your tri-clamps and gaskets, parts. Um, but as I said, when we're specking out spaces, we'll show trench drains and the pitch, which is usually an eighth inch to a quarter inch per foot to the drain. So that's a, a good rule of thumb to remember. And you can see those diagonal runs to there when we show the, the pitch of that to the architect. This uh, particular concept is um, brew pub with no food service on site. Um, show you a little bit, this is a class A chimney right here. So this is coming off the burner box, a uh, Riello burner here at the bottom of uh, the Kettle Whirlpool. And then so you can see really the diameter of this. There's a uh, barometric damper right here. So that's what helps give it like an air release as, as the burner turns off and on. But that is that um, chimney that I referenced that is certainly an expense that you sh should plan for when you are doing an indirect fire system or a steam system with that hardware coming off of the, the burner or gas vessel. Um, really showing electrical, this is inside one of our panels, so IFM, effector, um, you know, this is all low voltage connectivity, and then the Siemens um, VFD, so controlling your pumps, motors, and things like that, but this is what we do internally, but still you are working with a local trade. If your manufacturer is giving you a field wiring diagram, it's very important because then they are wiring your tanks, they're wiring your high voltage motors, your pumps, um, and then other low voltage connections being your lights, um, all of your cellar temp probes, your solenoids and things like that. So um, certainly when you're budgeting on the electrical side, it's not just your space as a whole thinking about lighting and things. I, I would say that that's another one that can tend to be a surprise um, because you are wiring a lot and typically it's, it's long runs. Most um, manufacturers, so if you, for every tank you, with us, you get 75 feet of low voltage cable. So that's a nice ask when you're working with a manufacturer, like what are you providing? Some will say that it's provided and then you get the tanks and it, it may not be there. And then you're working with the electrician for that extra hardware. Uh, steam piping installation. This was actually at that um, same brewery in Virginia, um, uh, Third Street. 
where uh, again insulation and then cladding around it in this particular case they wanted like hammered aluminum definitely looks good it's clean it's easy it's easy to keep clean spray down but again um, a big um, you know cost but you're also paying for it in the efficiencies with um, less heat loss faster heat ups um, for your boils especially um, more planning and, and build out certainly I think we've seen even some very small breweries succeed very quickly because of having one or two folks that are focused on a lot of marketing a lot of social media possible festivals we even see like some small breweries from time to time post things on BevNet or Brewbound which is kind of always a surprise but um, it's there's a lot of platforms out there I would always recommend either having someone internal or maybe subbing it out for a little bit where they're really good with social media and branding and you know can labeling things that are representative of your brand certainly we all hear a lot about collabs um, and and how they impact your marketing as well uh, this particular picture is a vitamin C uh, fun customer of ours in, in outside of Boston in Weymouth Massachusetts and you know where they started as literally just a can pickup open Friday and Saturday and then you know really their outdoor profile helped get them through COVID because it's just one big beer garden and you know not a lot of on-premise you know consumption other than on Friday and Saturday uh, now I think they're open four days a week do about 2,000 barrels a year or so you'll always the guys you see at uh, festivals and things like that <clears throat> um, other trends uh, big trends that we're seeing um, not just on the brew house and equipment but also categories within your style of brewery um, I think most of all, and this is a representation of an iPad that, we'll, that we can provide with um, a lot of our brewery functions, um, automation has become a much larger priority for efficiencies, for labor savings, um, whether it's basic automation on, you know, just on your variable frequency stuff, which is, you know, your, your pumps and motors all by percentage point versus by gradient it versus, you know, knobs and on and off switches. Um, but to auto knockout, auto lauder features, or full process automation that some of you may be familiar with where you have recipe programming or other things that's, you know, you're, you run it from the brew deck, not a lot of manual valves. Um, alluded to it a little bit earlier, uh, but certainly folks, again, around cost right now, grain because of gas, um, grain as a whole with everything happening abroad, uh, certainly looking at the scale at which you buy grain, whether pallet or super sacks, or you have the ability to have a silo, like what would that look like? Visited a, a customer on our way up here um, from Charlotte, and it's a pretty busy 10 barrel spot, but they're looking at adding a silo because it'll save them $100,000 in grain over the course of every year. So it's certainly super sacks for your average um, brewery of your base malt is, is certainly something to consider. Pretty minimal investment on hardware. You're looking at like an unloader that you that can connect right off of your forklift, and then you can have pretty manual um, attachments or or more automated attachments running through your automation. Um, definitely an uptick in, in lagering tanks, um, horizontal lagering tanks, which is which is fun. I'm more of a Pilsner lager Hellas kind of person, so. Um, you take up a vertical profile versus more of a uh, east-west profile because you can stack them uh, really above above 30 barrel horizontals you can really stop stacking about three high because of just the, the structural weight um, serving tanks seen a huge uptick in serving tanks really because of you know kegs the cost of kegs has increased the cost of chemicals because of gas fuel surcharges have increased and there's a lot less labor with serving tanks and some folks like the freshness and the aesthetic of it being the backdrop to your bar or single wall serving tanks in your walk-in cooler but you know less less uh, chemicals less labor instead of washing a fleet of kegs you're washing a single tank and again i think a big thing is 
the aesthetic to some folks if they are a jacketed serving tank in, in and around the bar. Uh, transport vessels, um, so if you're a brewery, and kind of what I said is that hub and spoke profile, we've built a lot of uh, transport tanks that will bolt, bolt into your freight liner. Um, van or your sprinter van if it's refrigerated we'll do like a single wall tank if it's not we'll we'll have it be jacketed just to be able to hold temperatures better if you're putting conditioned beer into there um, where they're able to take the beer from one place to another put it in tanks or put it in if it's just wort put it into another vessel for active fermentation and uh, and conditioning <clears throat> Canning, of course, um, it was pretty neat to be able to partner with Wild Goose um, last year. Um, just seeing the uptick in, in canning is absolutely remarkable, but it helped save a lot of businesses over the last couple of years. And really looking at um, anything from you know eight, eight to 12 cans per minute, I would certainly consider looking at it as we get questions from banks when they're going into final financing. Um, they will ask a lot of our customers if they have a plan for canning or what kind of packaging or serving on premise or off premise. I would definitely look at um, canning, if not an initial investment, you know, one to two to three years down the road. A centrifuge, again, another thing that's going to add some uh, increase your yield. Really, uh, I think a number that's safe to say is eight eight percent. Um, there's some folks here from Gia and Alpha Laval. Definitely, if you're at that stage, some great folks to talk to. Um, real quick, because I think uh, running out of time a little bit. Yeah, we got about uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, again, growth categories we talked a lot about um, hub and spoke breweries, farm breweries, destination, and, and brew distilleries. Um, getting into some, some photos of some green handling. This is a change to actually at uh, Torch and Crown in, uh, in Manhattan that we're doing this. They, they had to do this because it's a three floor uh, project and the grain handling is in the basement and the brew house is in, on the second floor below. So three sub basements and, um, and then the main floor where the serving tanks are. Um, big silo installation down in Houston, Texas. Um, to the Hub and Spoke profile, this is a group in, in Charlotte where they have their main production facility here and then they open a new location about uh, four miles away called the Trolley Barn Food uh, Fermentory. Um, so we built this transport tank for them. Um, so inside of the inside your tank or inside the van, be able to transport, in this case, um, unconditioned or unfermented just wort over to the other location where they have tanks. They do not have a brew house because of space constraints and that area wouldn't let them manufacture or brew. Um, they could only have uh, fermentation. Uh, so as you can see, you can remove this with a forklift if you want to use the van for other deliveries. Um, but certainly a unique investment if, uh, if you're that kind of business model. Um, another layout, this is a brew distillery in, uh, uh, outside of uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, a uh, three and a half barrel pub system, but where this support will also support um, the uh, small Vendome still, a lot of other utilities that are already planned for, boiler, chiller, air compressor, and there's another cooling tower outside to help support um, the functions of both of those systems. Um, lastly, like I said, resources, us, we hope um, not only with our partnership with the New York State Guild, but in, in just our own organic conversations with you all that uh, we hope to be a resource for you with whether it be kegs or you know, parts or, you know, really our bread and butter custom brew houses and uh, tanks. Uh, we also have a service division which offers, you know, more commercial construction, piping, glycol steam. Um, all those other services. And then the contacts for the folks I mentioned earlier, Wild Goose, Chris Leach is here. Uh, he's your New York rep for Wild Goose, based out of New Hampshire, and then the link to hospitality guys. Thank you, everyone. All right.